Hello and welcome to the Holistic Success Show. I'm Dr. Robert Puff. And I'm Elizabeth Lozano. Today we're going to have a guest coming on talking about success and how you can be successful. And we're going to be watching a couple of clips from Dr. Puff on the serenity prayer and how to live by it. And we're going to answer one of your questions about how to be holistically healthy when you're not feeling well. And then our other question will be about how to get a handle on impulsivity. Thank you so much for joining us and we hope you enjoy the show. Today I'd like to share with you one of the most beautiful prayers on the planet. You probably have heard of it. It's called the Serenity Prayer. And let me start by reading it. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. And this is a very beautiful, very wise prayer. The first part says, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. In life, there will be things that we cannot change. We may f face tragedies that happen, and they have happened. Your spouse has died, you have lost your job, and they will not take you back. You may be in prison right now. You could be suffering and being in bed lying with cancer right now, and though you're fighting it, the cancer is very present and permeates your body. There are things that happen to us that we cannot change. You may be taller than you wish you were. You may be the different color, skin color than you wish you were. You may wish you lived somewhere else. There are things that in life are a given. And it's important as you go through life to learn those which you cannot change to accept. You know, when you really reach a point where you say, I cannot change this. For example, again, the example of if you've lost your job and they're not gonna hire you back, you can fight that and say, oh, you know, why'd they do that? What's wrong with them? You know, or what did I do wrong? I wish I hadn't done that. Or you can say, you know, I've lost this job. I need to accept that and move forward. Another good one, which many of you may have faced or may be facing right now, is you have an illness, an illness that is life-threatening. And those can be very challenging and very difficult. You can say, this shouldn't be happening. I can't be dying. And you can fight that. Or you can say, well, I'm going to do the things and work on it as best as I, as I can. But I also need to realize that part of living is dying. And I need to accept that if I'm human, I'm going to die. And acceptance brings peace. Accepting life as it happens brings tranquility and helps you to relax in life, to be present with what is and to love life as it is. When you accept things that really cannot be changed, you will find that accepting them is a beautiful thing. An analogy I often use in relationships, if you're in a very good relationship, I will pretty much guarantee you there will be something about your spouse that you will not like. It will be something that irritates you. Maybe they snore. Maybe they leave the toilet seat up. Maybe they don't make enough money for you. But you love them for lots of reasons. Whatever it may be, but if there is something about them that is not going to change, you know, you wish they were taller, you wish they um, were, spoke better English, whatever it may be, if that's the way they are, you constantly being irritated by the way they are isn't doing you any good because you're trying to change something that you really cannot change for the most part. But if you accept it, say, you know, this is a beautiful person who I love and I've chosen to spend my life with, and they have some things that I don't like, Accepting that makes it go so much more smoothly because then you love them and you actually can learn to even embrace the change You can embrace that which you don't like so, you know, hey, maybe I'll get used to snoring It's not such a big deal and then by doing that you'll find life goes better when you accept things The second part is the courage to change things I can there are many things in life Which we don't like that we can change again getting back to the illness if you're struggling with some physiological disorder, I mean, seek all the help that you can. 
they, if their doctor's telling you to go exercise, exercise. If you're, if you're learning to eat well, eat well. If you're learning to um, go back to school so you can have a job that you enjoy instead of going to a job that you hate, do those things. You know, say, I can be courageous and change my life. Because when you change things, you better your life. And there are many, many things in life that can be improved upon. This whole show is about learning to improve your life. And there are an infinite many things in life that can be changed. So choose a couple and work on them and change them. And once they are changed, they become a habit. Then choose a couple more. Work on them, change them. And once they're changed, they become a habit. So change things when you can. And then lastly, know the difference between what you can change and what you can't change. Because there will be some things in life that you confuse. You can say, well, I really think I can change this. I mean, if you've been trying something over and over again, and the door won't open, that may be the time to accept and say, you know, I've tried hard enough. I need to stop doing this. And then there are times when you say, this door is an opening, but I really believe in this. Like, I really believe in helping out children who can't read. And I'm going to keep doing that because this is an ongoing problem. And even though it may last forever, I'm going to keep doing that. Years ago, I had a professor who talked about, you know, children and child abuse. And he said, you know, child abuse is always going to be with us, period. So what are we going to do? And you still care for and you reach out for people and you don't give up. But then at other times you take care of yourself and make sure you're okay and you accept what is happening. And you just learn to, through the serenity prayer, to flow with life. Change what you can, accept what you can't, and read the prayer over and over again. It's a beautiful prayer and it really helps ground you in living a peaceful life. Peace. Our first question this week is from Trudy in West Virginia. And she asks, I have struggled with health problems all my life and now I'm getting older and want to keep trying to be healthy. How do you truly become holistically healthy and what does it mean? Well, Trudy, first I wanna thank you for your question because it shows that you are still committed to being healthy. And as we age, I think a lot of people, what they do is they throw on the towel, they say, I'm done, I'm just gonna do whatever I feel like and give up on being healthy. And it's never too late to be healthy in any regard, physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, financially. We can always improve ourselves. So you are an example of someone who is committed to being healthy. And that's the first and primary step. I want to be healthy. Now, there's a whole way, array of ways of being healthy. And, you know, I think the first one I'll start with, and we don't have to talk about all of them today, but physically, you know, just do a little bit every day to improve your health. We had a guest on a few episodes ago who um, really had a lot of health problems as they got older and they made some changes and those changes really helped them to completely improve their life. So if you can say, hey, how can I today 5% improve my life? Perhaps, for example, you don't exercise and you can start walking around the neighborhood, you know, a little bit more or you don't eat very well. You could, when you order a meal, start eating a salad with your meal or there's just so many ways you can do it. Perhaps Elizabeth can chime in here and give me some ideas, but the point is, improve a little bit every day and what you'll find is that little bit of improvement gets you better because we're in life we're either growing or we're dying we're never staying the same so you really want to always be improving and keep working towards it to the day you die so that when you die you die, die gracefully with improvement on the way instead of you know, just throwing in the towel and giving up, don't you think? I absolutely agree. You had said something that was really important. You said it's never too late. And we actually had a woman on here, Renee Burton, a couple weeks ago, um, who her whole program is called It's Never Too Late. And it's never too late to be fit. And she actually has these programs working physically, physical exercise with people with arthritis. People are you know in their 80s and even in their 90s, even in wheelchairs working out. And she had this band that she showed us, mm. which I actually working out a little bit earlier using it because you can take it with you anywhere but I mean it doesn't matter how old you are and whatever your condition is even if somebody who say is really overweight you know and can't move much you got to start somewhere so I think you know really like Dr. Puff had said starting with the salad trying to incorporate that into your diet you know eating a little bit healthier and incorporating whatever exercise you can. Many years ago just to share on what Elizabeth talking about I had the opportunity um, to meet Mr. Rogers the Mr. Rogers you know of a Mr. Rogers neighborhood 
And um, I don't know if any of you know this about him, but he swam every day. He loved to swim. He'd get in the pool and he loved to swim. And I like swimming too. So we kind of had that commonality. We had a lot in common. Him and I went to similar schools and had similar backgrounds. And he's a wonderful human being. But what he did is he didn't, as he got older, because I met him, you know, towards the end of his life and he's passed now. But as he got older, he just continued to take care of himself and didn't give up on himself. And I think that was a good example for me. And I love, you know, people as they age to watch from them and learn from them because they they remind me that it's never too late and you can always work on yourself and we ought to and I'm I'm planning on it to the day I die and I know Elizabeth is too that we'll continue to work on ourselves and we join you we ask you to join us in that commitment to work on yourself a little bit every day improve your life so you can be whole healthy and have a wonderfully successful life thank you so much for sharing this journey with us and we wish you the best of luck thank you for your question I'd like to welcome this week's guest, Greg Reed. He is a number one best-selling author and entrepreneur and the CEO of several successful companies. And he's here to talk to us today about the book that he co-authored with Sharon Lecter, Three Feet from Gold. So thank you so much for joining us. Absolutely. You know, you always talk about the businesses I'm successful in, but we leave out the ones that didn't go so well. <laughs> okay. And that's all part of the game and also what the book's about. Okay. So can you start to tell us about maybe what made you develop this book and about all about the book and about the failures that you just mentioned? <laughs> well, absolutely. Well, a great classic inspirational book was written called Think and Grow Rich and published back in 1937. And the very first chapter from the late great Napoleon Hill was a story about R.U. Darby a gold miner who got gold fever, went out west and found a little hole. Started digging in it and sure enough found some nuggets. Woohoo, they're going to be rich. Yeah. Goes back home, tells his family and friends, and they chip in money so they can buy equipment to pull it out by the truckload. Well, sure enough, the first ore card comes out and it's filled with gold. But then the gold runs out. They keep digging, but there's no more gold. Finally defeated, Darby says, I quit, I give up, and walks out of the mine. He sees a junk man walking by and says, hey buddy, give me a couple hundred bucks, we'll sell you the mine and all the equipment. I quit. Well, the junk man being smarter than the average bearer went and sought out an engineer and said, what happened? They hit gold and they ran out. The engineer started laughing, goes, oh my gosh, that's so simple. Gold runs in a vein, a straight line. What he did is hit one side, discover gold and came back to the other. That's why they ran out. He says, all you gotta do is go back to where they discovered the treasure. Go three feet the opposite direction you'll tap back into the vein. And that's what the junk man did, pulled millions and millions of dollars out. And the message of this entire book is, how many times do people quit? You know, one class short from their degree or sales or marriage, it's easy to give up. So what we want to do is find out what people did to persevere through their challenging times. So I know that you have interviewed many, many successful people. Yes. So what are some of the things that you've heard and stories that you've kind of learned that you share about in your book that you're trying to teach people? Well, there's so many of them, but the one common denominator, see, we had the opportunity to sit down with the president of NASCAR to the creator of string theory, from Miss America to Mrs. Fields Cookies, all the way from Evander Holyfield to the guy building a space elevator. And the one common denominator they had was they had something called stickability. And that meant the power of commitment. They found something that they knew, not what they believed, but what they knew and didn't let anyone dictate what they could and could not accomplish. So it's kind of they knew in their heart something that they were passionate about, which is, I think, a very important element, right? Well, that's the whole key. I yeah. mean, so many people pursue what they believe, and that's cute, but it's not as powerful as something that you know, that burning desire, the passion, the purpose, and that's what kept them on track. So when we sat down with all these incredible people, we didn't ask them why they're so successful or what their, their mantra was. We said, what kept you going when you wanted to give up? And that's what the book is the accumulation of. And I think even, you know, I visited your website and I looked about your story of how you even created the book. And I think yeah. even the story of your book and the creation of this, and which has been turned into a, a film now, mm -hmm. I think that that would be important to talk about what's in the film, but not even just that, just as your journey through that and what that was like for you, because you must have had a vision, mm -hmm. you know, a passion. So can you share that with us? Well, absolutely. Well, actually, the Napoleon Hill Foundation, the CEO, Don Green, is the one who actually set this entire thing in motion. And he had the idea of going around and interviewing the greatest legends. Well, when Napoleon Hill started his journey back in 1908, he was never paid a penny. And the Napoleon Hill Foundation decided to pay me the same exact wage. <laughs> I mean, I got nothing, right? So I literally sold my house, my cars. I did whatever I had to do to pursue this quest. And again, I just knew that I was on a path that was so powerful and it was bigger than me 
that again, I wouldn't let anything stop it. Wow, that just brings chills to me because I think that, you know, I even feel that in my own life with the show, actually. <laughs> Very passionate about it. So yes. um, you've got a, some amazing, wonderful things. Now tell us about the, the film and what exactly people can see in the film and how it's different for the book, or is it kind of just the book translated, or how is it? No, it was a journey. What I did is a lot of people wanted to know what it was like to sit down with these incredible legends. So I bought a very inexpensive $250 camera, and I went along the entire journey and filmed it. So you see us walking into New York, the big publishing company is going, here we go, we're gonna get this big deal. About two hours later, I turn it back on, well, that didn't go so good, <laughs> you know? And it's true, we did not get turned down by every publisher in New York. Nope, most of them canceled their appointment and never even met with us. See, people didn't see what we had. And it was at that moment that I asked one of them, I said, be honest, what, what's going on? Why won't you take this? We have Napoleon Hill, we have the Think and Grow Rich brand with these incredible leaders. And they said, it's bigger than you, you need help. You need a co-author. And that's where Sharon Lecter came on board, co-authoring Rich Dad, Poor Dad book series, selling millions of copies. And then the same doors that were closed suddenly started to open. Wow. So, but it, it sounds like, you know, along your journey of, you know, the failures, you went to seek, well, what's going on? Why am I failing? And you, another door opened up for you. So instead of, you could have given up at so many times on your journey, right? Right. So I imagine that you must have been successful in this and hopefully you have a home now. And <laughs> you're not homeless, I don't think, hopefully. Well, I'm staying here on the couch. What are you talking <laughs> yeah. about? That's why I came with my suitcase. No, the whole process was a testament of three feet from gold. And what was really, really nice about this entire journey is, you know, we were feeling it and living it ourselves. But it's so funny how it all plays out. Yeah, we end up getting one of the greatest publishers of all time, Sterling, which is owned by Barnes & Noble. And we did the first deal in history where we actually partnered with Barnes & Noble as a co-op joint venture. So when you go into the stores, you'll see the whole shelves filled with three feet from gold. So we're very blessed. Oh. Wow. So if somebody wants to get a hold of your book or get a hold of you, obviously Barnes & Noble would be a great place to do it, but where else can they visit you? Oh, my website. It's alwaysgood.com. I got to tell the story how I got that. Though. Okay. Yeah. I was at a grocery store, true story, and I was going through and the cashier kept asking, like, how you doing? How you doing? She didn't care. Right? And everyone was saying fair, fine, fair to middling. And someone said a double negative, not bad. And I went, holy smokes, I'm going to come up with the double positive. So I went home and started writing all these things. Two days later, I go back to that same line. How you doing? How you doing? She gets to me and I go, always good. She goes, how can someone always be good? And I said, just like Abraham Lincoln said, people are as happy as they make up their minds to be. So always good became my own personal catchphrase and website too. And now you're sharing it with the rest of us. There you go. Now you'll remember it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for being a guest. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Earlier I was talking about the serenity prayer and how it's such a beautiful prayer to live by. But how do we do that? How do we actually implement it into our lives? And I'd like to share with a tool, share with you a tool that I found has been very helpful for me. And what it is, is when we go through life, once we've determined this is what I can change and this is what I can't, and we're working towards what we can change and we're accepting what we can't, what happens is thoughts arise all day long. They just spontaneously arise in our brain and when these thoughts arise what most of us do is we just go with them we think about them we may think about them for a second for a minute many people think about them for a day a week sometimes a lifetime we're just these thoughts arise and we just f keep going with them we don't realize that they're actually not helpful for us it's our ego basically just wanting to kind of rehash and rehash and rehash and rehash something that's already been solved because you know what you're working towards you accept what you can't change and then you're going forward. So how, when these thoughts arise, what do you do? How do you basically fight against them so you can have a quiet, peaceful mind, which is really the ultimate goal of happiness and success and living a really whole life. What you do is when thoughts arise, and what I do when thoughts arise, is I witness those thoughts. They're up, there it is. I'm thinking about, a thought arises about what I need to do tonight for supper. I say, well, I've already decided what I need to do for supper, so I don't need to think about that. So I witness it, I don't go with it, and I don't suppress it, I don't try to say, oh, don't have that thought, you know, that's bad. I just witness it, and then I get back to being with what is right now. Right now I'm talking with you. So for example, if you're watching the show, and perhaps you're struggling with something, like you and your wife are having a fight, but you're going to counseling, and it's really helping you, but right now you're still concerned about some things, what you would do is, is when the thoughts arise, well, what about this issue? You say, well, 
We're working on changing that. So you witness that thought that arises. Right now I'm watching this show. So I'm just going to watch this show. And I'm not going to feel bad about thinking about it. I'm just not going to think about it. I'm going to be present with what is. So you don't push the thought away because that tends to give it energy. You don't flow with the thought because then that gives it energy. What you do is what I call you witness the thoughts as they arise. And then you get back to being in the here and now. Because again, the serenity prayer is accept, change. But when you change something, you have a game plan for that. That's called goals. We've talked about goals. We'll talk a lot about goals. Once you have the goals in place, mostly what you're doing is being. Mostly in life, you just be. But these thoughts come and they come and they come. And what you'll find is if you witness them, if you just witness them and then get back to being here, right here, right now, they go away and your mind gets quieter, more peaceful, and you get to experience the here and now far more richly, far more fully. And what you'll find is a gentle quietness arises inside of you that is truly beyond words. It's very peaceful. It's very present. And I just encourage you to try that again, just so it's clear. Thoughts will arise in your brain. Don't try to fight them. Don't try to push them away. Don't flow with them. I mean, don't keep thinking about them and thinking about them, but witness those thoughts and then get back to what's happening right now. Because as I like to say, there's always something beautiful to be with right here, right now. Peace. Our second question comes to us from Robert Z in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And he writes in, I've noticed that I can be impulsive sometimes and don't like, like this aspect of myself. It doesn't happen all the time, but sometimes, especially when I feel a sense of urgency because of time issues. Plus, sometimes people are pretty good at making me feel pressured to make a decision. Any suggestions to help me with this? Well, Robert, first of all, I like your name. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I think in, as you go through life, what's helped me, if I can just share more of my personal experience with that, what's helped me to not feel as overwhelmed or pressured is a sense of trusting that basically all is well. There's a word called, that we all know of as pessimists, there are people that think negatively. And then there's a word called optimist, and there are people that think that everything's gonna turn out well. But there's even a better word that I like, it's called an agathist. An agathist is someone who believes that ultimately all is gonna work out well in the end. And I think if there's a sense of, you can trust and say, you know, there is whoever you believe in or whatever you believe in, there is a sense that I'm here for a reason, it all is for good, and I'm here to do my part in it, and you sense relaxed a little bit and say, you know, I'm just going to trust. I'm not going to rush into anything. Because when we rush into things, we tend to get in trouble. But when we, we stop, take a couple of deep breaths and slow down, slow down the pace. You know, it's that tortoise and the hare. The tortoise does tend to win the race of life. And just slowing down because, you know, you don't just, it's not so myopic. You're not just thinking about one thing. You're thinking about the whole picture. If I rush into this decision or if I let this person pressure me, Am I doing that at the expense of other things? You know, am I perhaps rushing so now I can't take care of myself? You know, one of the things I love to do every day is meditate. And because I like to meditate, that means I can't rush through things because I have to even give things up that may seem like they're great opportunities, but I like to meditate, I like to exercise. So because those are priori priorities to me, there are things I get, I say no to. But I think overarching for me has been the sense of, I do trust that ultimately, life is good life is going to work out well and if i relax with that what i have found and, and that's just me i think other people will agree with this out there that when you trust life life the universe does take care of us god cares about us and it will work out well so you just relax a little bit you say okay i don't have to ne necessarily make this decision i don't have to necessarily move on i don't have to necessarily go at anyone else's pace i just need to listen to my heart and when my heart's saying you know, hurry up, hurry up, quick, quick. I need to stop and say, no, I'm just gonna take a break and you know, perhaps go for a walk and you know, I'll address this later. And when you do that, life goes better. Don't you think, Elizabeth? I agree, absolutely. You know, I think it's important to know, I think the aspect of what you were saying is that, you know, if something is meant to be, it will. And it doesn't mean that I'm just gonna sit here and not do anything about it, but if I don't jump on this right now, if it's really meant to be, it's okay and it'll work out for me. You know, and I can understand, I've been looking at places, I'm gonna be getting married soon, and I've been looking at places to get married. And part of it, you know, it's like, well, we have this date available, or we have this, or whatever, but you know, you have to act fast, you have to make this decision. And I was really overwhelmed, and I was stressed out, and fortunately, my fiance was able to <laughs> calm me down a little bit. And afterwards, I took a look back and I said, well, 
well, thank goodness I didn't go with that place because that really wasn't what I wanted or wouldn't have been, you know, a good match for what my fiance and I wanted. But that pressure that was there, believe me, I felt it and I totally understand what you're going through. But I think what Dr. Puff was saying is taking a step back, you know, and really kind of waiting to just see, is this right for me? Is this the right decision for me to make? Because I think, you know, whatever decision we make, we need to really think through it. You know, think about how is this going to affect me later? How does this affect me now? And Robert, also just remember that I think it helps me and it might help you to say that, you know, there is, when you slow down, there's a more of a, you see more of the overarching picture. And sometimes what you can do when you slow down, you just step back a little bit, almost like you step out of your body and you look at the whole picture and you say, huh, I wonder what really needs to happen here. And so through that standing back of that word awareness that both Elizabeth and I love so much, you're able to look back on the situation and say, are there things that I'm missing? Do I need to necessarily rush into this? And if you don't rush into things, I think you'll find and test us on this. I think you'll find that when you don't rush into things and you really take your time and go out a more meditative life, that things tend to work out really well. And that Agatha's approach that I talked about earlier is really a wonderful way to see life because ultimately all is well and you learn to live in the now, love the now and experience life fully and richly each and every breath. Peace to you. Our quote this week is by Tony Robbins. If you want to be successful, find someone who has achieved the results you want and copy what they do and you will achieve the same results. This is so important because many times we can get bogged down and feel really negative by maybe not so positive things that people can say if maybe they've tried something and failed. So my suggestion to you is find somebody who's been successful at something that you're interested in. Don't just give up because you've heard people, you know, nay say what you want to do. Find somebody who's successful, read up on them. If you can contact them, do that and really try to seek them as a mentor. Follow your dreams, do what you love. Best of luck. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on another episode of the Holistic Success Show. Please don't forget to write to us with your questions because we can't do it without you. And if you haven't done so already, please subscribe to our website so you can get emails as to what our shows are about and all the wonderful things that we're doing. Also, you get a 10% discount on anything that you buy at the bookstore. And if you have a company or an organization that would like to have Elizabeth and I come give a talk, we'd love to. We have a speaker page on our website that talks about what we can talk about and how we can help your company be more successful. Thank you so much and we hope you have a wonderful week. Looking forward to seeing you next time.